Hey guys, it's Wednesday, September 10th, 2014, and I've got a nice chunk of comics here to review. So, starting off with Captain Marvel, issue 7 um, of Kelly, uh, uh, Kelly de Koenig's run. Sorry, I just blank on the name. Been a long day. Anywho, I don't know if I reviewed the first issue or so of these, probably, because it was... Yeah, I probably did. Anyway, uh, new arc begins here. Last one ended last issue. So, uh, yeah, new arc now starts off at what first seems to be in medias res, isn't really, um, which is which is good because it kind of goes bad at the end of that first scene there. Basically, the girl who uh, stowed away on Captain Marvel's ship before, still there. She's, I guess, a new ally. They go back to find the ship, uh, her ship, which disappeared way back in the beginning of this arc with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And, uh, Rocket's there, so it's her and Rocket again. And it, like, the main kind of setup for this arc right now is, uh, springs from a kind of like a small joke from the last arc about, uh, Rocket Raccoon calling uh, calling Captain Marvel's cat a Florkin, which is some sort of alien, and Marvel, of course, insists, no, it's just a cat. And it turns out Raccoon, uh, Rocket Raccoon was right the whole time, and it is a Florkin, and people are after it. And so that's basically the gist of this issue. Um, kind of just set up, nothing much happens. Dialogue's great as always. Uh, Rocket, Rocket's good. Captain Marvel's good. Uh, the alien Tick. Tick, I think her name was. She's good. Again, not much happens. Just kind of like a really exciting opening that ends kind of depressingly. And then, um, yeah, then the rest of this, which is, you know, first issues are hard. Uh, not, you know, it's not a lot of plot. Just set up, basically. Uh, Captain Marvel has an alien worth thousands of space dollars on her ship, and people are after it. Good book. I mean, I like the previous uh, previous arc a lot. This one probably not going to be any worse, which is good, you know. Probably like keeping up that high bar. Uh, so pick it up. Uh, next up is Hawkeye number twenty, um, which concludes kind of Kate's arc in California. It seems like, uh, which was one on. I don't know how long now, at least five issues, I think. Um, so this is the conclusion to that. By the end, she's uh, back in New York, or coming back to New York to rendezvous with Clint. And um, and this is a big issue. This ties up everything that was started uh, before, adds a few new things that it also ties up by the end of this book. So just a very kind of dense issue. A little confusing at first. This one actually does begin in medias res, and it jumps around the plot a lot too. And uh, at first, it was a bit hard. They just kind of throw a lot at you. It was a bit hard to follow, but it all does make sense by the end. Um, it all comes together. You all get okay. So this is what's happening. This is who these people are. Blah blah blah. And it's a very satisfying ending, emotionally and plot wise. You get, I mean, not only the end of this story, but you get a real kind of emotional closure. Um, and I'm guessing so does, uh, so does Kate in this. And that's kind of what you feel is she's finally done this thing she's set out to do. She's a hero in her own right. She's earned that respect. And now she has to go back to kind of her family, to the people that need her. And, um, yeah, it's just rewarding. I mean... Hawkeye is, this is going to go down as a, like, a legendary run. Uh, these, I think it ends at 22, with two more issues. And it's gonna, like, it's, so far, not a single issue has whiffed or missed. Um, I mean, there's been some weird ones, like the, the, the dog issue and the Christmas issue, which was kind of a cartoon, but so far, none of them have been bad. And this kind of just keeps that up. And I'm really excited to see how these last two issues go, the new, kind of the, the finale, you know? Um... But this was a good kind of sub-finale, you know, the end of one arc, and then the, you know, getting the end of the larger 20-issue arc now, but, or 22-issue arc that this thing has been setting up from issue one. And, um, 
yeah, I mean, there's no complaining about Hawkeye. So if you aren't reading this already, you really, you should be. Just go read, pick, up, pick up all 20 issues. They're, most of them's in trade by now, so you have no excuse. And then we have Amazing Spider-Man number six. Yep, number six. I can't read. It's backwards for me. I know it's it's not backwards for you, but it's backwards for me. So I'm, I'm going to have to look over every now and again. So issue six of Amazing Spider-Man. Again, kind of the end of an arc with um, the Black Widow Electro stuff. Still get a lot of silk. Again, kind of a lot. Not kind of. A lot happens in this issue. It picks up right where we left off before with Jonah, well, with Black Mask trying to unmask uh not Black Mask. Uh, it has been a very long day, folks. I hope you um, you can bear with me here. With Black Cat unmasking Spider-Man. And um, basically no one sees who he is because Jonah's a huge egomaniac. And it's actually a really funny way to open the book after, you know, a kind of dire point. And I kind of, you know, get that relief over there. And then we follow this kind of convoluted plot of black cats. And of course, Peter's involved, Electro's involved, Silk shows up more. And and it's been a, it, it feels like a short arc. It, it's been about three issues. But, um, yeah, no, it's mainly action. It's mainly fighting. There's not a lot of actual beats here. It's basically, you know, you start at the end of last issue's fight, there's um, a little rest piece, you know, recovery from that fight, and then big fight at the end, and then um, not much setup for the next arc, which is Spider-Verse, which we'll get to in the next book. So kind of one of those, you know, not happily ever after endings, but one of those, everything's solved, and, you know, we'll introduce a new problem when we get to it. So that sort of closing to an arc. Um, and th there's a few seeds of stuff um that's going to come, I guess, after Spider-Verse with um, Black Hat, you know, regaining kind of her clout among the villain community. And of course, you have the Peter Silk relationship. You find out what uh, she's doing after, you know, when not being Silk. And, um, and this whole, I guess, from issue one of this amazing Spider-Man, uh, Peter's been off the ball and you still have that. You still have them um, just kind of acclimating or reacclimating himself to being Peter and Spider-Man and doing a way better job of being Spider-Man than of being Peter at this time. Again, it's, you know, last issues are like first issues in a way. You know, it's just kind of the, the end of something. It's very final, very concrete. There's not much there because it all came previously instead of all being, you know, set up. Um, but yeah, no, I... I like Amazing Spider-Man. This is another good issue. Not much to say. I'm sorry. Um, I'm a little rusty too when it comes to this whole review thing. Don't know really much to say. The cover I found a little weird. The cover is one of those covers that really doesn't have anything to do with the inside of the book, which is not as often like in comics nowadays. It's kind of a rare thing now for the com for the cover to really have nothing to do with the uh, contents of the book. But yeah, this is mainly an action. Uh, action chapter, mainly fights, um, so pick it up if you like that, I don't know, yeah, it's kind of rambling on, and saying nothing a lot, like, well, not like, un unlike these books, but, uh, it, it has been a long day, and I've said that three times, I don't, I don't know, moving on to Spider-Verse Chapter 1 with Spider-Man Noir, and again, another issue one, but we kind of have that set up from Superior Spider-Man 32. I'm going to cheat. Yes, Spider-Man 32. There's a checklist at the end of this book, actually. So, yeah, Spider-Man, Superior Spider-Man 32 was the real issue one to this. And this is a kind of self-contained Spider-Man noir story. Um, I mean, at the end, you know, the, the whole Spider-Verse tie-in comes back with Otto... Uh, saving the day, but I mean the villain, the the main Spider Verse villain, the, the the this guy, the guy in the scuba mask, this guy over here, he doesn't show up until like the last four pages, and so the main hunk of this is just a dedicated Spider Man noir story, and 
it is weaker than Amazing was. Um, but again, you don't have anywhere as much kind of real estate to build it up. As a standalone kind of noir, Spider-Man noir versus Mysterio, Mysterio noir, it's really good. I mean, I enjoyed it. It kind of had, um, I want to say it had kind of a Batman feel, which I guess is kind of the point of noir. You know, it, it is very dark and kind of, you know, noir, which is what Batman kind of is natively. And you kind of get that feeling from this, um, and not, a, not as much detective work, of course, but just the, um, feels like an episode of the animated series, because at one point Mysterio has has a Spider-Man noir locked in a, in a thing that's slowly flooding with water, and he has to escape, so all very um, Harry Houdini slash the prestige, I guess, um, of it. Just a simple, you know, one-off kind of story. Um, but enjoyable. Well done. Um, I'd pick it up, and I, I did pick it up. I'm really interested in Spider-Verse. If you're interested in Spider-Man, I see no reason not to be. And um, even if all of these are just kind of self-contained, here's one of the Spider-Man, you know, books, you know, short story, I'd be totally cool with that if they're like this quality. This was a fun little uh, Spider-Man noir romp. And um, I'm excited for Spider-Verse. I can't wait to really like jump into main spider-verse thing but just the edge this is this isn't even spider-verse all these books are just leading up to it and i'm not going to pick up some of them one of them i'm not there's one of them i'm not picking up oh boy but um yeah no it's like a good lead up very just kind of vignette -y. so if you just want like a short Spider-Man story that's kind of not your average Spider-Man story, yeah, so why not? There are worse books, believe you me. Jumping into DC now with the Futures End tie-ins, we have Constantine, Futures End, Constantine, is it Tyne or Teen? Because I always just naturally say Constantine, and then correct myself to say Constantine, because that's how I heard it's supposed to be pronounced, but I'm not actually sure. So we have Constantine over here, and like the other, um, like the other Future Zen books, this has been really kind of self-contained, um, and it feels like just an issue of Constantine, which is neat that it, it doesn't feel so much like a crossover. It just feels like you know one of an issue. Basically, the setup is Constantine is trying to trick another magician into kind of defeating himself. This time, it's uh, Naboo from, you know, the, the Dr. Fate helmet. Basically, Dr. Fate, the, the helmet's trying to get Constantine to wear it so he can host, and Constantine, of course, has this kind of multi-beat plan and wins at the end. Sorry if I'm spoiling too much, but, I mean, Constantine is in the Future's End book, and he's not Dr. Fate, so it's kind of a self self-fulfilling prophecy. Foregone conclusion was the term I was looking for. Art's really good. Art's better than normally, than what you normally get in Constantine. Um, like, it's kind of the same palette, but there's just more of a uh, kind of just a through, they get the full spectrum of light to dark here. I really like the blues and uh, just how much everything doesn't blend together, but, but just between these two pages, you see it's like you have the one, the, the very kind of deep blue, and this is a very deep red, and but it's the same kind of tone, even though one is blue, one is red. It's the same tone, the same, the, the same shifting from darker to lighter as you go from the inner of the image to the outer of each image, so it's just very nice art. And of course, the, the writing, I think, is pretty solid in this. The plan doesn't seem convoluted. It all makes sense. It all seems like, you know, he could have planned this in, in, in advance. So if you're liking Constantine, if you just want to see an issue, uh, if you're interested in reading um, a book where it's kind of like a battle of wits and uh, kind of this kind of chess game between the characters instead of like real fighting, this isn't really a physical book. Constantine's not really a physical character. Then pick it up. Um, it's pretty, I wouldn't say it's a good jumping on point for Constantine, but it's a good taste of what the normal book is. And it's actually probably just because it's a single issue, a lot, uh, I'm gonna say, not better, 
They're just a lot more concentrated and a lot more distilled. So um, yeah, pick it up. I, I recommend it. And now we have Batgirl Futures Ed number one, the last Batgirl issue written by Kale Simone. I thought last month's was, but no, it's this one. And um, it's interesting because I, uh, I I skimmed through the Birds of Prey uh, Futures End and it kind of ties in with this a little. I'm not exactly sure where. I'm pretty sure it would come before, judging by how this one ends. But it's an interesting, the, 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 this one is an interesting kind of journey into the heart of darkness kind of story. Um, basically in the beginning, uh, Barbara suffers, she just gets married, and it's not to the, the Frankie, or whatever his name is in the normal Batgirl book, it's to this other guy who we don't really know, but then tragedy strikes, and uh, Barbara decides it's not worth being Batgirl anymore. The Batgirl inside her dies, and then we're introduced to a new trio of Batgirls, who happen to be uh, named Cassandra, Stephanie, and... Her last name is Fox, so I'm guessing Lucia's Fox daughter. I don't know if she's a previously fleshed out character, but you get the Batgirl trio here. We get an explanation of what happened to Barbara in the uh, time past. You can tell on the cover she turns into this hybrid of Batgirl and Bane, which is actually really neat. She calls herself the Black Beast. And um, it's like... You normally don't get that kind of feeling with Batman books of, you know, whenever Batman turns to darkness, you don't really get that it's like this real thing because Batman is supposed to be this corrupt, incorruptible individual. So having it done with Batgirl kind of makes a lot more sense that she, sh she suffered so much tragedy in her life. And this is the thing that finally broke her spiritually and the whole breaking thing, you know, you have Bane shows up in this book, so the whole breaking thing becomes a thematic kind of linchpin of this book. Um, but you kind of get the, this whole, you know, this is Barbara doing her best to remain a protector of Gotham City, but she just doesn't have it in her anymore spiritually to be Batgirl, so she takes up this other identity, she trains other people to be Batgirl, and, um, but, you know, at the end, she's still Barbara, and you gotta kind of see that play, you know, that playing through of just this, this innate you know, goodness of Barbara Gordon versus the tragedy of Gotham, the tragedy of her life, and which side ends up winning out. Um, or rather, how the sides kind of collude and work together to be this better person than either, or the stronger person, rather. So, just another really solid Batgirl book. Gail Simone's kind of last hurrah on Batgirl. Of course, she's moving on to Secret Six again, which I'm really excited for. I'm going to pick that up in December. I think it comes out, New Secret Six, Gail Simone. But as a last draw on Batgirl, this is just a very nice book. It also kind of captures what the whole Batgirl arc has been since the New 52 reboot of Barbara getting over this tragedy, you know, previously being in a wheelchair now, in this, you have uh, her husband dying immediately after the wedding, and struggling to to hold on to that light, and um, Batgirl, the, the main book has been, this is how she keeps it, and this is how she loses it but reconciles it later on or something. Anyway, very good, I recommend it. Now we have Futures and Batman issue one, and um, like right off the bat, um, right off the bat, man, what I guess it's important to note about this book is that it's not written by Scott Snyder. It's um, written mainly by Ray Fox. I think it was Ray Fox. Yeah, Ray Fox. So it does have that kind of different feel. It doesn't feel as natural, um, you know, just as a book as the other issues have felt that have been uh, written by the main, you know, writing team behind the book. This does feel more like a one-off or a tie-in than... Uh, the rest of these have so far. But that doesn't mean it isn't good. It is good. Um, but what struck me is that this doesn't feel so much a tie to Future's End as it feels like a continuation of Scott Snyder's story from um, Detective 27, the one where 
uh, Bruce Wayne continues Batman way into the future, and it's like every the, kind of this whole clone thing of of, uh, of Bruce just cloning himself, so there's always a Batman in Gotham, and it feels more like a tie into this or to, to, to that to that story rather than a um, rather than Future's End, and it actually feels a certainly considering we have Batman in Future's End, he was in Future's End Zero. Um, he sent Terry back in time, and we see it's a different Bruce altogether, which is kind of weird. Anywho, like the the Detective comic one felt like a more tie. -in. Anyway, so another thing that helps it tie to Snyder's story from Detective Twenty Seven is the art. Pretty sure it's the same artist that did the the Detective Twenty Seven story, and um, it's kind of a prequel to that. In that. In that one, of course, you have the cloning set up all set up already. You have it that Bruce has been cloning himself for hundreds of years at that point, I think. And this is how our Bruce Wayne, how the original Bruce Wayne, kind of gets that started, which involves a break into LexCorp. And that's the meat of this book, is kind of our Bruce Wayne's <laughs> last hurrah, again, like last mission, his kind of dying crusade in order to make sure there's always a Batman, a Bruce Wayne Batman in Gotham. And it's him versus the LexCorp building. And you have him basically at the, at the, at the end of his rope. He's more nanomachine than man at this point, and the nanomachines are only barely, barely keeping him alive after the you know beating he took over his life as Batman. Um, and so that's basically it, is Batman at the end of his rope, going on this one last mission in order to um, in order to secure kind of a, a future for Gotham and he ends up running into Bizarro and it's a good issue you have that struggle of just Batman just being this kind of tenacious to a fault just dedicated to a fault um, to, to the point clearly in this book to the point of just way past self-harm even um, like way past any reasonable level, um, and just the, the the beating it takes on on Alfred, who's still alive in this book, on Bruce, physically and mentally. Basically, you see the lengths that he goes through, and it's tough because at many points is like, and you know he's not going to die at the end. Like of course, just on a meta textual level, you know that, but through the book, you, you just it it really conveys how much of a struggle this is and how he's literally like barely threads left and he just keeps on fighting and uh, he keeps on winning because he's Batman and that's what Batman does so it's very satisfying um, I mean if you're just interested in Future's End this is a, this is probably a skip if you're interested in like the main Batman story whether that's Scott Sanders telling it's probably a skip but just on its own merits it's it's not bad, but it, I don't know, it's just a different quality from what we usually get from this book, and it doesn't really feel like it belongs. Like, yeah, it just, that's the main thing, it just feels so different, it feels like it belongs in Detective 27, and not in Batman Future's End. So, because it feels so out of context, it's hard to really judge. Like, if I were to just pick this up as a single issue, I'd be very confused. Um, and just because of that, because it's so jarring, it's hard for me to really gauge whether or not it's good. Um, so that that's that's it on this. But like, I, I, I'm not going to say I didn't enjoy reading it. It's a fun story, but it's hard to tell if it kind of belongs. It's just weird. Um, but, I don't know, it's $4, I think without the lenticular cover it's $3, um, so this, this is very, just kind of toss up for me. Again, not bad, but it was kind of weird, um, no context. So, moving on to the next book, which is Future's End. Issue, what issue is it? 19. 
And I have the same issue with this, well not so much the same issue with this one as I had with last week, but the same issue with this as I have with a lot of the future Zen books is that they jump around a lot. Um, instead of a book where you're getting kind of a whole story, or at least, you know, a story that's self-contained within that book, or at least just one kind of plot, you know, one story, you have three stories or four stories. I think in this one it's... Well, in this one, it's only two, three stories, four stories. No, you're getting four stories in this book. You're getting um, Terry breaking into Turkey Court. You're getting Lois Lane dealing with uh, Shazam now Superman. You're getting Ray Palmer at Stormwatch. And you're getting um, uh, 50 Sue and Deathstroke in, at Cadmus Island. And because, you know, this is a normal-sized book, each thing is split, you know, this comic is split into four books, and there's not enough time for each story to really develop past, you know, past a few, like, kind of oh-snap pages. You know, past a few, okay, this is something happening, but it doesn't feel like a, like a movement. It feels just like a stop, you know, like, event, stop, event, stop. It doesn't feel like a, a continuous line. It feels like just kind of snap, 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 snap. Um... <clears throat> I hope I'm conveying what I'm trying to say here. I just, yeah, it it feels like a series of images instead of a movie. I guess like a slideshow instead of a story. Um, yeah. Anywho, and it's it's a weekly, so it's you know again it's kind of hard to say you're gonna miss much if you skip a single issue. I mean the only but because that style of storytelling, it feels like every issue has something to do without moving. It's weird because you're being t it's more you're being told you're moving than you actually feel like you're moving um, through the story. That's probably the best way to put it that I have so far. Um, I mean, honestly, Future's End probably isn't worth it um, just as a book. Um, I mean, at least as a series of books. Maybe in trade it'll be better and you can read it all at once, but, like, I don't know why I'm picking this up anymore. Um, I just kind of feel stuck in it, I guess. And it's not, like, that bad of a fiscal, you know, it's not like I'm losing that much by doing so. Um, but yeah, hard to recommend this one as much as the last one. At the same time, it's just as easy to not or just as easy because it's I don't know I don't know how much how, how much longer we're gonna be reviewing these because it's always that same sort of you know motion without feeling kind of car sickness. So moving on to another book, a better book in my opinion, Superman Unchained issue eight, and uh, so it's the final two issues. Well, this is the penultimate issue. Next issue we get is gonna be the last one of this, and this one feels like a Kind of like Cockeye 20, like a conclusion to a story already, just in its own right. Because uh, in this one, you get the conclusion to the Wraith Superman fight. Um, you just get that whole thing. I mean, you get Superman outwitting um, this, the, this Wraith, who is stronger, faster, just kind of physically superior to Superman. And then you get how Superman beats him. And it's very satisfying because you get, again, this whole thing has been more about the soul of Superman and the power. You know, what separates Superman from this other guy who's more powerful, who's more Superman than Superman. And this is what, you know, what, what makes him the, the hero. And you get that in spades. You don't get so much the compassion thing, but you get just the kind of the heroics, the why Superman puts himself out there, why he fights all these fights, you know. Um, so yeah, just, and this whole book is kind of a deconstruction of that, of like what makes Superman Superman, you know, compared to all these other superheroes, and, uh, you get a very good conclusion, uh, just to this, and then you have another, like, the real finale of the story, and it kind of feels tacked on, like, and it won't, it probably won't at issue 9, but as of now, it feels like, oh, tacked on, we have one more big threat that you have to deal with. Um, but this, I think that really goes to show just how satisfying your conclusion to the Wraith story that this is. Um, 
So yeah, pick it up. And pick up the rest of Superman Chain if you haven't either. Um, just good books. Very good series. Very limited miniseries so far. Um, maybe collect it in trade. It'll probably all be collected in a trade. Pick it up then, but definitely give it a read if you're a fan of Superman. <coughs> and the final book uh, to review this week is Batman Eternal, number 23. And this one feels a lot kind of less coherent. I don't want to say coherent, but what I said about Batman, I think Eternal, it, how it differs from uh, Future's End is that um, this separates it so you're getting one story per book. Like it's, you know, the, the overall Batman Eternal story has multiple kind of red lines. You have Batman, you have Batgirl, you have uh, uh, Gordon, you have Selina Kyle now, um, you have Killer Croc. Like it's so many stories, but each book focused on so this is the story we're going to tell today, and then this is the story we're going to tell next week, and then this is the story we're going to follow up, you know, the week after that. And this one, it concludes the story we had last week with the architect and Batman beating the architect and discovering hushes behind that all. And we have the kind of the conclusion to that, but it's split up, um, or rather, it kind of comes at the end of this. No, it's split up uh, by this Catwoman story. And I forget where in the story Catwoman appeared before, if she was at all. I mean, I know she was in, I think it was Batman 27 or Batman 28, where they did the flash forward to Batman Eternal. Um, and you see Selina Kyle as kind of this kingpin instead of this thief. And so this, I, I, I don't remember if she was in Batman Eternal since then, or like in Batman Eternal proper. But this kind of follows how she became that. This is the beginning of kind of that storyline. Um, we see Catwoman being a thief until she's drawn into the bigger picture. We find out a little more about Selina Kyle's history and kind of what prompts her to become or what might set her along the journey to become a, uh, a crime lord instead of just a thief. And it's very interesting because you get this kind of dynamic between Catwoman and another character that really fleshes her out just in terms of because you're getting this history, you're getting more of a context for what she does, why she does, and why she kind of keeps it to a relatively small scale as someone so skilled as she is. And then, as I said, you have the conclusion of Batman versus the Architect, which ends with kind of another wham, like another bang, you know? Uh, another development that literally shakes up what's happening in the storyline. And... Um, Reminiscent of Cataclysm, just in terms of what happens, uh, like if I have a spell already, an earthquake happens, and you just kind of get, you don't get what happens after the earthquake, this just kind of ends with the earthquake happening, but Batman is unable to prevent it, and he's still stuck in Wayne Tower, and Hush is already finding a way to turn this to his advantage, even though Batman prevented the fall of the, the tower. Um, he has kind of caused a much bigger problem. Um, so just keeping that plot forward, adding more, adding greater stakes, eventually bringing us to that tease in the beginning of Batman Eternal Number 1, where Gotham is destroyed. You're kind of getting, okay, so this is how that's happening. You know, this is how that's going to end up. You even get a nice shift in palette, where um, you have like a very red sky, like you did in the beginning of that. So, like, these very subtle things that make the story feel like one big story. Um, so, yeah, very nice. But this issue, uh, you know, as you get from the cover, mainly focuses on Catwoman, mainly fleshes that out. You're getting kind of another budding storyline there. And, um, yeah, just a well-done single issue. Not single issue as in self-contained single issue. Single issue as in, yeah, this is a good issue, is part of a larger story. So, yeah. I, I like it. And that's the last proper book today, but also uh, in stores is this thing. It's free. It's just a celebration of 75 years of Marvel. I haven't read it yet. I just flipped through. It has a top 75 books. Um, it has other things. I don't know, but I mean, it's free, and it seems like thick. It's a substantial free thing, so might as well 
pick it up. I'm sorry this uh, this video is a bit kind of rambly and unfocused, as I said before, long day. Um, and it's just been it's kind of a weird batch of books this week. Um, so, yeah. Um, I still hope that, maybe not enjoy, but that you tolerated this, that you will give me another chance next week to show you, I guess, what these videos will hopefully, usually, be like. And, um, yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you next week.